Matthew 24, beginning at verse 36 and reading through verse 44. And the word of God today from the King James text reads, But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment today, Father, once again, God, we come boldly before the throne of grace. As your word declares, it's our privilege as children of God. The word of God is our most valuable asset today. From the word of the Lord, we glean that which is necessary to grow our faith and to establish our hope. Lord, we gain great comfort from your word. We are encouraged by it. We are lifted up by it. We are instructed and inspired by it. And Lord, today accept the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Rest upon the preacher of the gospel. There is nothing that man can say, even if derived from your word, that can benefit anyone. We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We need the Spirit of God to speak to the heart of the hearer, to help them know that what they are hearing is a divine truth and not merely a man-made dogma or doctrine or thought. Lord, today my body is tired, my mind is tired. If ever I've needed a touch from the Lord to be effective and faithful in delivering the word of God, I surely need it today. Help me, Lord. People are relying upon a message from you at this moment. Help me to deliver that message. We ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. It is growing increasingly less popular to preach or to speak of the rapture of the church and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word of God tells us that as we approach the last days, there would be many who would mock and many who would make fun of those of us who are foolish enough to believe that one day, as promised in God's Word, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to split the eastern sky. And he is going to descend not all the way to planet earth, but just enough so that he's under the cloud cover. And the people of God, those who love his appearing, those who are looking for his appearing and waiting on his return, will be called up to join him in the air. In the word of God, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, 
The Lord Jesus Christ declares, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Hallelujah. So Jesus Christ himself promised that he would come and he would take the church to be with him. That's what he said. Amen. Now, we know that the world after the rapture of the church will not cease to exist. The rapture of the church, the catching away, as it were, of the bride of Christ is not the end of times. But when that occurs, the end will be within three and a half years. So it's, it's, when that occurs, it's important that people who don't go have enough sense to recognize that some of us have gone. Hello now. Because the clock will begin to tick at that moment and the second portion, the second half of the tribulation period will begin and that is the period of time in which the Antichrist will have declared himself to be God in the temple of God in Jerusalem. So none of this can come to pass without the temple existing. You know, when I was a kid, Johnny, they loved to preach the rapture as a means of scaring the life out of you. Do you remember that? Amen. Growing up, I mean to tell you, uh, it seemed like the rapture and fear were synonymous. What a sad state of affairs when men, preachers of the gospel and women, can so pollute a wonderful event in the life of the church and turn it into an event that is to be feared. I'm telling you, as a child, I think I wasn't afraid of the rapture. I was terrified of the rapture. Well, part of the problem is those who preach the second coming of the Lord, the rapture of the church, those who preach it as a fearful event don't understand grace to begin with. They're preaching salvation as relying entirely and completely upon who? Upon you and I. According to them, Johnny, if we've done even the least little thing wrong, if we've misstepped, if we've misspoken, if we've misthought, then the Lord comes right then. Oh, bless God, you're going to miss the rapture. Well, I've got news for you today. That is wrong. That is a misunderstanding of the grace of God. That is a misrepresentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your righteousness and my righteousness, which secures us on the guest list for the rapture, does not rely upon our behavior and our conduct and how perfect and righteous and godly we can be. It relies entirely upon how perfect and righteous the Lord Jesus Christ was and is. Hallelujah. And by faith, he has clothed us with him, His righteousness. So as long as our faith remains intact, we have nothing to fear. The rapture of the church is nothing we need to be terrified of, but rather it is something we ought to be looking forward to with great anticipation. Well, I'm going to tell you, in this age of Trump and this age of uh, of deceit, deception, and, and Christians being so easily deceived and misled. I don't know about you, but I'm looking for the rapture of the church. I'm looking for the day when God takes us up out of this mess. Amen. 
But you know, the Lord gave us any number of signs concerning the rapture. He explained many things to us concerning the rapture. And one of the ways that the rapture is taught as a, uh, a means of eliciting fear is by constantly saying, Oh, it could be tonight. Hallelujah. When I was a kid, if I sat through one sermon, I sat through a million that said, Oh, it could be tonight. The Lord could come tonight. Right, Johnny? It could be before this church service is over. Hallelujah to God. It could be while we're in our cars headed home. And I mean, you'd just be shrinking in fear. Oh, Lord, have I done anything? Have I said anything? Am I, am I not where I ought to be? And boy, I mean to tell you, them preachers could fill them altars up with a bunch of weeping, slobbering, snotting people because you'd be so terrified the Lord was going to come and you weren't ready. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is uh, the Son of God, that He lived a sinless life, that He died on the cross of Calvary, that He rose three days later, that He ascended to, on high and one day will return for his church. Well, yes, I do. Then you're ready. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. And that means you're ready. Amen. Amen. The word of God said, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, not we might be, but we shall be saved. Hallelujah. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation so there is nothing to fear I don't fear the rapture today I'm ready I'm set I'm willing and ready to go hallelujah Amen. I'm standing today at the starting line of the racetrack and I'm waiting for the Lord to sound the sound that indicates it's time to leave this old sinful, filthy, hideous world where people do one another dirty, where Satan has reigned, he has power over people, and I'm going to a city like we sang today where the Lamb is the light and the devil has no power. Hallelujah. There will be no more sin. There will be no more sickness. There will be no more death, nor mourning, nor crying. There won't even be nighttime. Amen. I love this time of year when the clocks roll ahead because I can't stand when at 5 o'clock in the evening you go outside and the sky is already dark. I don't know about you, but Bill, that drives me up the wall. I like light. Amen. I like the light. Now, Bill served in the armed forces and he did a tour up there in Alaska. So he knows what it's like to have daylight all the time. I don't know in this body if I can handle daylight all the time. I, I don't mind dark when I want to sleep. Amen. But see, in heaven, I'm not going to need to sleep. So if I'm not going to need to sleep, then I don't need darkness. Amen. And in that city, the Word of God promises the Lamb of God will be the light. And there will be no more night. My God, have mercy. I look forward to heaven. But there's nothing to fear concerning the rapture of the church. There are things that must transpire. There are things that must come to pass. Jesus said, no man knoweth the day nor the hour. The day nor the hour. Every time you see some pitiful soul trying to predict the day the rapture will take place know in advance that they are mistaken don't be fearful don't be troubled don't be concerned they're wrong well how do you know they're wrong you won't know until that day oh i know they're wrong because jesus himself the living word of god has told me that no man knows the day nor the hour they can't even pinpoint it johnny down to the day Never mind the hour. So I know for a fact when some preacher comes along and says, Oh, the Lord's going to come on this and such a day. I know already he's wrong. Because he's told us 
Nobody knows. There is no flesh and blood, earthly character that knows. The only entity throughout all of creation that knows the day and the hour is the Spirit of Almighty God. Even in His physical form, the Lord Jesus Christ, that knowledge was withheld. God literally kind of shelved that so that only the spirit knew, not the flesh. Do you follow? I'm going to tell you, there are things your spirit knows that you don't know in your flesh. You ever had, you ever been doing something or getting involved with somebody and all of a sudden something inside of you said, no, 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 you, you don't want to mess with this one. You don't want to tinker with this one. Something ain't right here. Now you have no reason in your flesh to feel that way or to think that way. You've not seen any indication in your flesh that there's trouble or there's a problem there. But your spirit knows. Do you follow what I'm telling you? So your spirit can know things that your flesh doesn't know. And the Spirit of God could know things that Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, did not know in the flesh. Do you follow what I'm saying? And that's why he said, no man knoweth the day nor the hour. Only my Father. What's he saying? He said, only the Spirit knows this, not the flesh. The flesh is not aware of this fact. But there are things that must transpire before the coming of the Lord. And one of the, the clearest signs is the temple in Jerusalem must be rebuilt. Well, I got news for you. The temple in Jerusalem today is non-existent. It has not been rebuilt. They are not back to a place where they're able to offer animal sacrifices in Jerusalem. But don't get too comfortable now and think, well, if that's so, then I've got plenty of time. I had a Jewish friend in New York City some years back, and he and I were talking one day, and I told him, I said, I've heard from missionaries that uh, are over in Israel, I've heard that there are uh, bodies within Israel who are literally recreating all of the furniture, the accoutrements, everything that goes into the temple. And they're doing it now, and they're preparing all these things now, because you have to understand, all these things have to be literally uh, made to God's specific standard. God literally gave Moses uh, dimensions, sizes, materials. He told them exactly what kind of material he wanted used, exactly what size it was to be, so on and so forth. And I said, and I understand that there are bodies within Israel who even now are recreating all of these things in anticipation of the temple being rebuilt. And he looked at me and he said, how do you know that? I said, oh, word gets round. He said, I know that's the truth because my rabbi has talked about this and how that there are uh, groups of people over in Israel who already have begun to make sure that all the accoutrements of the temple are created in advance so that when the temple is rebuilt, they'll be ready to move right in and set it up virtually overnight. So the plans are already in the making for the rebuilding of the temple. We're not that far away from the rebuilding of the temple. That time is coming near. So don't get too comfortable and think you've got a whole lot of time before the Lord comes and you can go out and play games and you know mess around. And uh, Listen, if you're playing games with God, then you don't really believe God. You know, well, I can live like the devil and I'll still make the rapture. Pastor told me, no, Pastor didn't tell you that. You've got to be ready. You'll notice the first word in my message today is ready. Well, part of being ready, the Word of God tells us, is we're looking for His coming. 
Well, if you're looking for His coming, you're not going to be out there acting the fool and playing games with God and living like a dog. No, part of being ready for the coming of the Lord is being a witness and a testimony to an unsaved world because we want to bring as many people with us, God willing, as we can. Amen. I don't know about you, but I want to see a whole lot of faces in the rapture. I want to be able to look across the sky and see my cousins and see my aunts and see my uncles and see my loved ones. Amen. I don't want to go to glory and find out they've all been left behind and now they're having to face the most difficult time that humanity will ever know. According to the Word of God, the last three and a half years before the second coming of Christ. Now the rapture is when the Lord catches away the bride. But you'll notice in our primary text today, the Lord compares the rapture of the church with the days of Noah and the ark. Doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Well, now, when Noah and his family members got on the ark, did they stay on that ark forever? Did they live on that ark for the rest of eternity? No, they did not. The flood came. It visited great destruction and death upon planet earth but then the waters receded the ark came to rest upon mount ararat and noah and his family were able to disembark and they were able then to repopulate am i telling the truth all right guess what the same thing is true of the rapture we're only going away because god according to the word of god God does not judge the righteous with the wicked. That's what he has said in his word. God does not judge the righteous with the wicked. So for him, Johnny, to visit a period of uh, judgment upon the world, the second portion of the tribulation, he's got to take the church out first. Church can't be here for that because if they were, he would be judging the righteous with the wicked, and that's not how God operates. So the church is removed for that period of time. Afterwards, however, we will return, but we're going to return not as, you know, a bunch of people who have been caught up in a UFO for three and a half years, but we're going to return as a conquering army at the Battle of Armageddon. Hallelujah. And the forces that have gathered against Israel in the valley of Armageddon will be destroyed by Jesus Christ and the saints of God as they return for this great battle. And then the Lord is going to set foot upon the, upon the Mount of Olives. He's going to return just as His disciples saw Him leave. And He is going to enter the city of Jerusalem. And that will be the beginning of His earthly reign. Amen. And the new Jerusalem will come down out of heaven as a bride adorned for a husband. And that is going to be the begin, beginning of the Lord's earthly reign. The earth will be renovated. The Word of God said it will be renovated by fire, meaning God's going to burn everything up that's here. So if you think, you know, I, I always laugh. I hear people who are Jehovah's Witness. They say, oh, well, after Jesus sets up his earthly Rain, you know, I'm going to have that house over there. I'm going to have that over there. Uh, honey, you don't know your Bible very well. That house ain't going to exist. That house won't be here. So you won't be able to have that. He's going to remake everything brand new. And when he remakes it brand new, the entire planet will become the equivalent to the Garden of Eden. See, the Garden of Eden was only one little tiny spot in all of the Middle East. But God is going to remake the entire planet, and the entire planet will share all the attributes of the Garden of Eden. Isn't that wonderful? And there won't be oceans. There'll be no need anymore for waters to divide us. So I imagine the Lord's going to level things out a little bit. 
I imagine that there won't be such deep pits that today are filled with water, you know. And there won't be oceans. There'll be no need for the separation of the nations and of the people. It's going to be a very different world. Let me read to you what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Paul writes, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, meaning dead, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now listen to verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Isn't that funny? Paul says, comfort one another with the promise of the Lord's coming. Comfort one another with the promise of the rapture. You see, the rapture was never meant to be a source of fear. It was never meant to be a source of terror. It was never meant to be used to cause people uh, to be terrorized, but rather it was to be a promise, Johnny, that we clung to and that brought us great comfort. Amen. I've got news for you today. If you believe this gospel as you ought to believe it, then you are comforted by the reality that Jesus is coming. Hallelujah. Right. I am comforted by the reality that Jesus is coming. I'm ready. I believe this thing with all my heart. I believe it. I'm not just talking it. I believe it. Amen. Amen. And I know that my righteousness is of Him. It's not about what I'm able to do to earn heaven. It's not about what I'm able to do to make heaven. No. He has promised me that if I believe in what He has done, that He will reward me with righteousness that I have not, in fact, earned. Hallelujah. That's the message of the gospel. That's the good news of the gospel. You don't have to be perfect to make heaven. You don't have to be superhuman. You don't have to be something that you're not. All you have to do is hold and cling to your faith. I'll tell you, a lot of people in today's world are so disappointed and disgusted by what's going on in the church world that they're beginning to lose their faith. There are people today who once were part of the Christian church who are now involved in Buddhism and are now involved in Hinduism and are now involved in Muslim uh, Islamic belief. And my friend, I'm here to tell you that is the only thing that can cause you to forfeit your ticket on the rapture train. Amen. It's about your faith. It's not about your perfection. It's not about your holiness. It's not about how perfect you can be. But it's about your faith. And we cannot afford today to allow anyone to steal our faith. Paul wrote that when the rapture takes place, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which, alive, which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to join Him in the air. Amen. So you see, there's a difference between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. The rapture of the church, He catches us up. 
The second coming of Christ is when he will return and physically return to planet earth. During the rapture, he only appears in the air. During the second coming, he returns to planet earth to establish his kingdom and to establish righteousness and equity and perfection as it were. Amen. Ready, set, go. I feel sometimes like I'm a racer standing at the starting line with my fingers down by that line, brother, and I'm kneeling down and I'm just saying, Lord, I can't wait. I can't wait till I hear that trumpet. Amen. I can't wait until I can get out of this mess. God created us as spiritual beings. You don't even know how wonderful. You don't even know how beautiful the spiritual existence will be. When you get there, a lot of people are afraid. A lot of people are concerned because they've never experienced it. And they're afraid of things they've never experienced. Well, i got to tell you a little secret. Instinctively, you are a spiritual being. And when you get into the spiritual realm, when you get into God's realm, it's going to be old hat to you. It's going to feel perfectly natural to you. It's going to feel exactly like, you, you know, you've been there before and you're perfectly comfortable with it. Because in reality, that is your true nature. The problem is, you've never experienced your true nature. As long as you're in a body, you've never experienced what it is to live as a spiritual being. But when you get to that place, I'm going to tell you, you're going to be thinking, my Lord have mercy, why in the world did I waste all those years in the body? Why in the world did I waste all those years living a life? How many people, my mother played a movie, you know my mom, she loves her DVDs. And she played a movie at her house the other day about that little girl who had been diagnosed with a very serious illness, you know. And, uh, I mean, it was very, very serious. And she was going to doctors for treatment and all this. And uh, her family were people of faith. They were church folks. And then one day she and her sister were playing up in this giant tree. And she accidentally fell down through a knot in the tree. It was a huge tree. She fell down through this knot and literally fell 30 feet down the center of this rotted out old tree and hit her head. But she didn't break her neck. She didn't kill herself. Instead, when they finally got her out of there and everything, they found out that somehow, some way, her condition was now cured. And the doctor couldn't for the life of him figure out how this happened. He, he did, And this is a true story. This isn't fiction. This literally happened. And the doctor couldn't tell her what happened. He couldn't tell her how it happened. And she said, so what you're telling me is my daughter is cured. He said, well, as a physician, I can't say that. said, but we call it spontaneous... Remission. Well, you can call it whatever you want to. The fact of the business is she no longer has that condition. And the doctor was dumbfounded. But this little girl had literally been healed. But she was in that tree for several hours before they could get her out. And one day she was sitting with mom and dad and she began to explain to them that while she was there and she had gone unconscious, how that she had gone to heaven. And she had seen the Lord and talked to the Lord. And she said, I didn't want to come back. I told him, I don't want to go back. I like it here just fine. How many people have you heard tell stories about what we refer to as near-death experiences? And how many times have you heard them say, I didn't want to come back. When God told me I had to go back, I didn't want to go back, right? Why would that be? Because your truest nature is spiritual. And when you finally get broken out of your cage, which is your body, and you're set free and you're able to experience your spiritual nature, I'm going to tell you something, it's the best thing in the world. And most people who get there don't want to come back into this mess. I've told you the story about my hospitalization in 2000 and how that twice 
the Lord asked me, do you want to come home or do you want to stay? And I was so sick and so weak and so tired of fighting and Oh, my goodness. And I said, Lord, I want to go home. I, I don't want to stay. I want to go home. And I begin to feel my spirit rising up from my body, literally. And I, 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 I never had experienced this before then, and I've never experienced it since then. But I'm going to tell you, it was the most amazing experience that I have ever experienced in my life. Johnny, I felt like a prisoner being let out of prison. I felt like a bird being let out of a cage. You know, we sing those words like when we sing, I'll fly away. You know, like a bird from prison bars has flown, I'll fly away. That's what it felt like. As my spiritual man began to rise from my body, I literally felt this incredible freedom. I felt completely separated from all anxiety and fear. And oh my goodness, it, I, I can't even explain it. It was the most amazing, wonderful, positive thing that I could ever experience. And it were, were it not for the work that I was doing, I would not have changed my mind and asked the Lord to let me stay. I'd wanted, I would want it to have gone ahead. But all of a sudden I was reminded of the church and the people in the church that I had. And knowing that our style of church, if you want to call it that, is not the most popular and that there were not ministers lined up to take my place if I were to leave. And all of a sudden I said, oh, wait a minute, Lord, no, I need to stay. I've got a work to do. I need to stay. I'm going to tell you, if I hadn't said that then, I wouldn't have been here in 2002 to start the work in Dallas. Oh, I want to tell you today, folks, if you've got loved ones who have passed on, I want you to know something. They experienced something that you and I can only look forward to. They experienced the separation from all anxiety, all fear, they experienced the elation of being set free from the physical existence. And I'm going to tell you a little secret, and, and I hope it doesn't hurt folks' feelings, but they don't set up in heaven thinking about you all the time. <laughs> they don't. Part of what helps people in God's presence to be free of anxiety and free of concern is the fact that they're separated. The Word of God said that the dead know nothing, meaning they're not aware of anything that's going on down here. And that is for their benefit, amen, so that they don't have to. Let me tell you, my little great-grandmother, if my little great-grandmother was floating around as a ghost, having to watch my life and my brother's lives and her grandkids and great-grandkids, she'd be eternally fidgeting and fretting and upset, and you know, because she was always a worry wart. She was always concerned for her kids, her grandkids and her great-grandkids. So in order for them to be free of that, they have to be separated. And believe me, there's so much good going on up there that it's like being in an amusement park and having the run of the place, and you're not thinking about mom and dad at home. You're not worrying about what they're eating for dinner. You're not worried about what they're going to wear to work the next day because you're too caught up in what you're experiencing. Amen. And I want to tell you, your loved ones today who are in the presence of God have experienced and are experiencing the Word of God said, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love Him. You can't even imagine what they're experiencing. You can't even imagine what they've seen or what they're doing. Amen. And you'll get caught up one day because the Word of God also tells us that after the resurrection we shall be known even as also we were known. So our relationships will get caught up. We'll be able to catch up with our loved ones. We'll be able to talk with them and love them and share with them when we get over yonder. But in the meantime, thank God they're free of any anxiety related to old planet Earth. 
There's nothing to be afraid of. Yeah, old Pastor Charles still preaches the rapture because it is a truth of the Word of God. I will always preach the rapture. Uh, I'm not ever going to back down from preaching that one day Jesus Christ will return for His church. But I don't preach it today as a source of fear. I preach it today as a, as a source of comfort, as a source of hope, as a word of encouragement. In Hebrews 9.28, the Word of God said, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for Him shall He appear the second time without sin unto salvation. See, I'm ready for that event. I'm looking for Him. You know, we stop believing He's coming, we stop looking for Him, don't we? Yeah. Amen. If you don't believe He's coming, then you won't be looking for Him. Well, I got news for you. He's only coming for those who are looking for Him. So it's important today that we hold fast to our anticipation, to our expectation that the Lord is coming. That's why when we baptize folks, we ask them to make a profession of faith. And I ask them, do you believe that Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary, that He lived a sinless life, that He performed miracles as evidence of His divinity, that He died on the cross of Calvary, arose physically, literally from the dead three days later, that He ascended up into glory and will one day return for His church. And that is included in that declaration of faith. Why? Because He's coming for those who are looking for Him. Amen. Right. Oh, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm all set. I've got everything settled with God. I've believed and obeyed the gospel, and I hold fast to my faith. That's all you have to do to be set. That's all you have to do to be ready, is hold fast to your faith. Let no one steal your crown. Amen. That's what's required to be ready, to be set. And I'm looking for the Lord to say, it's time to go. Hallelujah. Ready, set, go. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Somebody.